along with the credit level, credit level course. I'm so nervous because you know candy camera. Um, <laughs> talk about engaging in the classroom. One of the things for my classes that we normally do, and um, I see three people from the previous one from my Agile 101. One of the things that I normally do in my classroom to engage my students, I choose what is called a secretary. And the secretary in this case, his or her position is to choose how the class is going to be divided up into groups. We also talk about there's no um, monetary award afterward, but it's all about participation. It is also their way of engaging and learning their classmates as well too, because even though if I have to learn their names, they should learn their classmates' names as well too. Another uh, purpose of it is, is that they don't feel that the instructor is always in front of them. They have their classmates they're participating with. So with that, their classmates are the ones who choose to go into groups. If there's a day, which I call the award day, which is awarding points, the class decides as a group how the points are going to be divvied up. One of the things I started three years ago um, with my classes, in this case, I started where my class in the beginning decides exactly how many questions on the quiz. So on the first quiz, they get together and they talk with each other exactly how they're going to do this. So you have this competition of maybe three questions, five questions, and I tell them to thy own self be true, but be careful what you ask for. So they always, it's, it's a wonderful way for them to engage as well too. And I started doing that so that I have my students who are like, this is boring. Um, what are we doing here? Why are we here? But it's a way to get them to say, you know, they're a part of the class. We as instructors, I tell them, we as instructors know the material, but you are the students who are taking the courses. So how can we engage you more into the classes? How can we engage you into the lessons itself? A lot of times, especially with mathematics, and my colleagues would um, say the same thing, that we get students who are always saying that how math is related to the real world. So I show them by engaging them into different scenarios, using real world scenarios, using their lives in some of the scenarios as well too. So for example, my favorite students, and I'm going to say this until I'm no longer a professor here at Triton College, uh, my favorite students are Snoopy, Heathcliff, and Garfield, and Gutierre and Buquisha. I always use those individuals to pick on in class so that no one gets singled out and no one is picked on. But I use having those um, individuals in this case to give examples and how to get my students engaged because sometimes they didn't know how to do so. So for example, if I say, well, you know, Charlie had a question. Who's Charlie? Not knowing there's a Charlie in the class, but I'll use Charlie as an example to say, well, Charlie had this question. Maybe we should help Charlie with the question. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind that sometimes I will have maybe two or three people in the class that are afraid to ask those questions. So I'm using my fictional characters to represent them to get them engaged as well, too, and say, you know what? I was thinking the same thing. Oh, Charlie's on point. Charlie's not a real student. But it's to get them more engaged in the course as well, too. Um, a lot of times, especially if it's really nice outside, we haven't had the chance to do that this semester, I'll take them outside. I take my students outside and we engage in mathematical problems. I also get them engaged into how the community on the campus is working. I think there's a lot of different things that we could do. Um, those are some things I do in my classroom for mathematics. I think with students in different disciplines, and as instructors for you all in different, di different disciplines, it's not easy for you to do. But I think one of the things I think is important is that you remember what students that you're dealing with and some of the things that your students are understanding, the material that you're trying to present to them and try to bring in that real world experience along with some collaboration of their input as well too. Because a lot of times they may have a lot of valuable input of how to do things, they may be scared to actually address those things in the classroom or how they relate in the classroom as well. Um, without further ado, I will bring my next colleague up here, which will be Roseanne, to talk about how she engages her students in her classrooms. Roseanne? All right. So, okay, I'll just, um, all right. So I think I, I have to agree with Tuan about um, like a lot of what he, a lot of what he was saying. Um, I, I, if I could sum it up in one word, it's belonging. So like all the things he's describing, you got someone as a secretary. You show them where it's where you, you show them where it's meaningful. I, there was something else you just said that I was like, oh, that's belonging. But anyway, belonging is like my biggest thing. Um, picture yourself. Has anyone ever showed up to a place underdressed? 
That's like the story of my life. How uncomfortable? No, seriously, even today. I, I, like, I, so anyway, you get there and you feel really uncomfortable because you feel like you don't belong. But sadly, like students actually feel that way. Maybe their parents didn't go to college. Maybe they don't have a lot of money. Maybe they have two kids and they're not the traditional student. For whatever reason, they're all coming in. And, and if they feel like they don't belong, they're at risk to be a lost student. They're at risk to be the one that just stopped showing up someday or whatever. So if you can create belonging, like Tuan will introduce people to each other, that's huge. And anything that will create, that's what that, that's been my new mission. Like if I can make people feel like they belong here, then it, we're going to be all good to go. So anyway, that's my, if I had to sum it up in one word, it's that. But anyway... So I just tried to make a couple slides of like how um, how how I do engage students because once they feel like they belong and they're a part of something, like he said, that they become a part of the decision making. Then they feel ownership and they feel that belonging. Like this is my class and we're gonna have five questions on that quiz tomorrow. Like like he just said. So anyway, um, the, these are the way I try to, the, way, the ways I try to build it. Um, the first one is know everyone's name like the first or second day. Um, and th and this one's huge in a lot of ways because it just nips behavior problems in the butt. Because when you get a behavior problem, something takes hold, and you just say, like, um, Kevin, you're not supposed to be eating in here. No, <laughs> not like that. <laughs> but, you know, like, Kevin now knows I know his name. Like, you know, he's not going to disappear into the crowd because I already know his name. I'm already noticing him. I'm going to notice that he's not here. So w when, once someone knows you know their name, it gives you a lot of, like, I don't know if the word is power or what, but it's it's huge. Like the second a student realizes that I know their name, then they have a different like vibe towards me, just in general. But anyway, so knowing everyone's name, like as soon as you, and by the way, that was super hard for me because like John got to experience this firsthand actually as we walked in here. I used to be that person when someone's introducing themselves, I'm literally just not even listening. I don't know their name. Like literally five minutes later, I was like. And then I'll continue talking to that person for years and never know to the point where it's like the point of no return, where you can't tell them anymore that you don't know. Has anyone ever that? Ever? <laughs> anyway, that, that was the old me, though. That was the old me. What? Did that happen to you? I said, that's why you always call me dude. Oh, it's totally. I got dude, buddy. Hey, buddy. Hey, pal. Seriously. You guys don't even know. Years. And until recently, when I actually went to a workshop, and they're like, learn your students' names. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Right. Uh, duh. So I, I, now I use this face merge. Like, okay, so I worked with a guy in college named Dan. He was a cook. Really cool guy. I just face merged it. I'm dead serious. That's why I was looking at you. I hope you didn't feel uncomfortable. But. Anyway, so, you know. So when I, once I made that a huge priority, just in general, just meeting people out on the street, not just with my students, like, I practicing it, I don't know, it, it's doable. If I can do it, like, anyone can do it. Because I'm not kidding around. I, I thought I really had something wrong with me for a while. Anyway, so then this one is, this one's such a priority to me, and it, se it seems, like, not attainable. But I, I really make sure I talk to every single person every single time class meets. Because... Like, the thought of somebody coming through, going unnoticed, that, like, just makes me feel sad right off the bat. But, like, th then I know I didn't hit the belonging. You know what I mean? You slip in, you slip out, no one notices, no one knew you were there, no one, no, no one notices when you're gone. Like, that type of thing is going to take away from that feeling of belonging, and, th and that's going to take away from that, the retention that you get that goes along with it and the success rates, right? So anyway, I, I just make sure I talk to them every single time, and then hope I try to, you know, like, it's hard to remember from a Tuesday to a Thursday who was absent, but if I do, I'll say something like, um, I'll be like, Tina, oh my gosh, where were you on Thursday? It was like a day without sunshine. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I just look at my roster. But just to make a comment, like, hey, where were you? Like, we did notice. That wasn't, that was really lame. And sometimes I'll put a guilt trip. trip. Like, Tina, Kevin was really upset when you didn't come in the other day. Like, he, I had to send him to a counselor, and he did, like, talk about it. And, like, <laughs> all that. But just a silly joke, but just to say, like, hey, no, we did notice that you weren't here, and it was not, it wasn't, wasn't okay in my book. Like, I don't know. So stuff like that. Um, so the way that I, I can get myself to, to talk to everybody, every single person, which seems like a big feat, is sometimes just as they're coming in, like, oh, hey, how's it going? Oh, hey, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, hey, all right, you know. But ask them about their lives sometimes. Sometimes if I see people glazing over, which can't imagine that happening in a math class. I, mean, can't, I, I know you guys probably can't even picture that. Like people getting glazed over. I know. I don't, e I don't even know what I'm talking about. This is, this is just a hypothetical thing. So, like, you see people getting glazed over, you could just take a minute. 
So now I'm not one to waste class time. Like I want to max out the whole entire time. But if you see people are glazed over, they're not even learning anyway. So what I'll do is I'll just be like, hey, you know what, you guys, we need. I think we need to like take two minutes to talk about something else because I'm seeing a bunch of people glazing over, however you would phrase it, right? So I'll go like, I'll just say, you know what, let's take a minute. What are you doing this weekend? What are you doing this weekend? Uh, I don't know yet, no idea. You haven't figured it out? That sounds like a good weekend to me. What? It's not like it's Thursday or Friday. What day is it? Shoot, it's only Tuesday. Okay, never mind. What'd you do last weekend? When it's before Wednesday, you asked me what they did last weekend. What'd you do last weekend? Is it fun? I went out for Chinese food. What? I'm having a recurring theme of Chinese food today. Mm-hmm. First, I was thinking about it because I was hungry. Then someone's like, "I love Chinese food," and now you're talking about it again. I don't know. Is that you're just me? It's weird. Fried rice. Mm-hmm. Um, John's bringing in Chinese food. What? John said he was bringing in Chinese food. <laughs> no, you didn't. Well, we <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so you just take a minute because, I mean, we're not having that problem right now. So first, you know, if everyone's in, in it and then you start going off topic, that's a different story. Then you're, then that's irritating. It's like, okay, come on, I'm trying to learn here. But, like, if, if you see everyone's glazed over, that's when you pull out the, oh, let's just take a minute. What movie have you seen lately? So, John, that question's for you. What movie have you seen lately? Does yeah. Oh, John? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. John, I'm sorry. Okay, John, Jim. And by the way, once I mess it up, I told you, I already warned you guys about my, my thing about names. Once I mess it up, it's like, okay, Jim. Yeah, I forgive you, Sylvia. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, Black Panther. You saw it? Oh, my God. Was it good? One of my students threatened to get up and walk out if I didn't go see that, honestly. So one of these date nights, I'm going to do it. I can't wait to see it again. Seriously? Wow. Who has seen that? And do you all think, like, it's a definite? Yeah. So oh, it's going to be, like, the best movie I've seen in a long time? Okay, cool. But don't Forrest Gump it for me. Someone Forrest Gump, <laughs> Forrest Gump, they said, oh, it's the best movie ever. So the whole time I'm like, any minute now, it's going to be the best movie ever. And it just never was. Cause I, so I hope that doesn't happen here, but I will see it. Yes, Jim. Oh, so you're sure you're going to see it? Yeah, totally. Okay, well, Why, are you going to spoil it for me? In that case, it totally sucked. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Oh, reverse psychology from a psychologist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a special really moment. Lame. Anyway, so, you know, just take a minute. Like, if you see, p- it, it, and I am not one to waste time, so I'm not saying, you know, but I, I am a, I, I'll invest that one or two minutes just to, like, get everybody back pumped up and back in it, and then it's the old switcheroo, like, back to math. But um, so that that's one move I do. Um, taking turns, uh, like so, I can't obviously ask everybody how their weekend was every single time. But I'll just rotate it around. Like, okay, now this week it's you three. Just try to in my head what I can keep up with. But this is the big one. This is the biggest one right here that I use all the time. Sorry, this is so small. You guys want me to make the font bigger? Can people okay. see it? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so I ask questions during the lesson about the lesson. So that leaves like keeps us on task. But then there is still, like, they're still being noticed. They're still getting to have, like, you know, um, getting to have a, a part of the class and that kind of thing. Um, so I'll go over more about that because this is a big part of all my lessons. My students would literally get inter- interrogated. Not really, in a good way, but I ask them a lot of questions. And um, so I'll tell you about that in a second. So here it comes. So questioning people every single class period, every single person. So every single person in the class should expect to be called on every single day. And it doesn't need to be something serious. Um, so am I, can, I, can I write on this? Or should I? You can try. Uh, I wonder, like, that that's a dry erase. It's in the little box next to the... Yeah. Here? Yeah, this. Oh, interesting. Let's see if it'll work. Oh, uh, man. To what? To... Um, <laughs> I don't want to take up too much time. Sorry. Yeah, but I don't know. What is this? Is it say? There you go. This. Oh, cool. Okay. Oh, but is it gonna go back? Yeah. Let's do that. No. Hmm. It wrote, but it's just too dark. It did. Oh, oh cool. yes. So I the blue. Dang. Oh. Um, right up here. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? I was just thinking we can change the color. Oh yeah. There we go. Let's make it white. White or yellow. Is that white? Okay, I think we're. Like I do with my students in my class. Change the 
She's the what? Yellow. No, that. Ah, oh, uh, no, I don't. I don't know what we're not doing. Oh my I'm gosh. Stress. Just red. Not thinking. Red. See, we we, we planned this on purpose because we wanted you guys to be a part of it. You know. Why is it not <laughs> choosing? I think there's. Ah, eh, whatever. That's okay. So, I wonder. Um, maybe if I can write over here on this thing. That thing over there. Maybe with one of these. Use squares. Oh, let's just do that. Oh, here we go. Okay. Oh, I go and that works. works. Yeah, but then we need to get back. To yeah. All right. So I want to demonstrate to you how. I was hoping. How I'll ask questions. Math. Who here loves math? Does anyone love math? Yes. Wow. Except trigonometry. Come on. Trigonometry is the bomb diggity. Are, are you serious right now? Is anyone getting nervous about being called on? Because you're all going to get called on. Are you ready? No, maybe I won't call on everybody, but I'll just demonstrate how I do it, all right? So, okay, and I'll just do something actually. All right, here we go. Ready? Um, so this is the equation of a line. Y equals mx plus b. Okay? And this is always going to be where you start. When you're going to graph y equals mx plus b, b is always going to be where you start. How are we doing, everybody? we doing okay with that? Okay. So we're going to get the coordinate plane, and we know we're going to start at what number, Teresa? What number are we going to start at? Five. Boom. Nailed it. Teresa just got called on. So you see what I'm saying? It doesn't have to be some groundbreaking question where, like, Teresa is cracking the code to the universe, so she feels a lot of pressure in front of everybody. It could just be, like, a natural flowing thing. Because cause what I've noticed is it'll hold people accountable. Like, oh, no, my teacher's going to call me. I need to actually be paying attention. And then secondly, you know people actually go, they know what's going on. So if I call on Teresa and she's like, uh, then I'm going to say, okay, I didn't probably do a good job of explaining that you have to start at five. You know, so that was just like a silly example. And it's a mathy example. And math gives people anxiety, usually. So if you can help them with, like, calling on them and they, and they get the practice of, like, hey, that's not that big of a deal, then, I don't know, that's always been my take on it. But how, um, okay, yes. mm -hmm. do you try that? Why do you want to go back to that number? It's the input. Oh, the input. I see. Okay, cool. So anyway, um, so that's that's what I mean by calling on every student. It doesn't have to be something serious, and it doesn't have to be something long. Just like what I just that type of thing. And that was that wasn't. I don't think that, I would consider that easy. But you know, right then she got to say like, oh, cool, yeah, I understand my teacher, and I got to say, oh, cool, Teresa knows what's going on right now. You know, and it was just kind of fun in general. So that's that's my one thing. And now here's the thing: a lot of times in a class, I would I could say like, and what number do I start at? And then a few people would be like, five. You know, like that one. So that's that's called a choral response. So I did this like workshop on questioning once, and they said you want to stay away from the choral response because it lets people just disappear into the crowd while the same five answer all the questions. So that's why I'll do a little bit of both. Like I'll do choral, and then sometimes I'll just call on people, but everybody knows they're going to be called on. So like that alone has them on the edge of their seat. Like, uh, like I don't know. So I feel like that was a helpful workshop for me. So that's how, that's how, um, how I've been doing the questioning. Um, next one, don't assume someone won't know the answer. So I specifically chose someone that didn't raise their hand that, I lo that loved math. Because I'm like, because that was the person that I could have been like, well, that person might not know. Let me call on one of these that knows. So I basically, you want to, you don't want to assume anybody won't know an answer. Like, you, I don't want to look at you and go like, oh, this guy's probably not good at fractions. Yeah, she, she probably doesn't. I'm not going to call on her because I don't want, I know she just starts freaking out. And I don't do that because it, it, that, like, that, in, in my experience, will convey a message of like, oh, you don't get it? Oh, that's okay. Okay. Next, um, Kevin. Kevin gets it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So if you feel like someone might not get it, don't avoid them because then, you know, it's almost like giving up on them. So here's what I do with that. Ready? If someone can't answer a question, help them by asking more questions. So, say, for example, say I, I had called on, um, oh, man, shoot, Dan. Say I had called on Dan, and I was like, Dan, where do I start? And Dan's like, oh, one half? And I'll go, well, you always start at the B, right? So Y equals MX plus B. So which one's B here? I would just ask him which one's B. And then he'd be like, oh, five. And I'd be like, you always start at the B. So where do you start? And he'll go, oh, five. 
You know, instead of saying, when someone's like, I don't know, I just ask them more questions. And I tell them that. I say, if you say, I don't know, I'm going to ask you probably like five more questions. You know, anyway, so if someone that can't answer it, I, I help them by asking them more questions to help them realize that you can't figure it out. Anyway, so that one. And then emphasize the value in making mistakes. How many people have noticed that students get really weird when they make a mistake? They're so embarrassed and like scared to make a mistake. You've seen it, right? Oh, yeah. What are your feelings on that, Kevin? Um, <laughs> uh, to quote some old song, that's a crying shame. Totally. Uh, um, you know, I got out of grad school in the late <laughs> 90s and more and more, I say 98% or more of why I make certain decisions as a teacher has to do with mistakes that I've made totally. as a teacher yes. <laughs> and wanting to correct those mistakes. Absolutely. I mean, I don't even, I mean, if I had a time machine, I'm a science fiction fan, if I had a time machine and met myself, you know, <laughs> on that first day of teaching back in, you know, 98 or whatever it was, and says, here's how I'm teaching you. The other people would go, what are you insane? Why would you be doing that? Really? You know, um, oh, yeah. the, right. um, uh, I saw um, uh, the, um, the actor-comedian, Monty Python member John Cleese, for a while, one of the things he was doing, he was making instructional videos for uh, uh, people in business. And he did a whole video about uh, for salesmen. Mm -hmm. And part of what this point was is that you don't learn anything if you're terrified of making any type of error. Whatsoever. Totally. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is missing, especially in the new generation coming out, like maybe like the t early 20-somethings, maybe 20s. It's like this phobia of making a mistake. You know, so I'll come over, because we, we use this computer program, and then I'll see red on the screen. I'll be like, oh, what happened here? You know, and you can just see they're so embarrassed. Like, I don't know, I just, I, I was getting him right, now I got him wrong. But it's just kind of like, hey, like, relax. It's fine. I made probably 1,000 mistakes just on my way to work here today. <laughs> like, seriously, trust me. You know? Yeah, and that's the cool. thing, you just have to be like, hey, we all make mistakes. Point out someone in the room that hasn't. Here's the biggest mistake, not learning from the mistake. You know? Like, so, if they can get comfortable to make a mistake, then it's golden. Because then you got people that are going to adventurously answer questions, you know. So any way you can just remind people, like, hey, making this mistakes is actually really important in your learning process. Almost as important as getting it right. Actually more important than getting it right. So I don't know. So that, that's, that's a big thing. If you can get rid of that fear of making mistakes, that builds the belonging, you know. And then you can call on them and not have to feel bad about it because nobody's worried about making a mistake, you know. It's like, um, does anyone, oh, well, all right, I'll just keep going. Um, and then this one, I, this has been my most recent one, is acknowledging people's workload. That was a psychology thing that it took me 35 years to learn, like acknowledging what someone else's deal is. You know, um, because it's so easy to be like, oh, come on, your job's easy. Look at this guy's job. It's so easy, and that person's life is easy. But truthfully, like, our students, like, some of them are working full time, some of them are working three jobs, some of them have multiple kids. They have so much going on. And so, like, uh, they'll say, like, oh, I couldn't do it this month because I had this or that. And I'll, like, and I, and, and so my latest thing is to just acknowledge it and be like, listen, I know, I know it's really hard. But, you know, acknowledge it, but say, like, but it's important that you do this work now because of X, Y, and Z. So I'll just, sometimes I'll pull up data on salaries based on education. When someone's complaining, like, oh, you give us so much homework, I'll say, hey, do you want to be rich someday? Like, you got to, like, figure this out now. Because here's the salaries, low education, high education, and it's l a linear progression. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So once they see those salaries, oh, suddenly everyone's real motivated. Like, oh, look, bring it on. Let's follow me. Give me some more homework. Because they want to make a lot of money. Um, and then if you, um, if you can show the job related to your field that you're teaching about, a lot of times in math, they're literally sitting there like, what am I ever going to use it? And you're like, but look at this computer and look at your phone and look at the car you drove here and look at the building you live in. It's all math. So someone had to like learn that so you could have those things, right? So you, you know, so anytime you can show the relevance to like your particular subject, some are easier than others. I feel like that's a good thing. I'm just trying to go fast. This one's the biggest one. Um, uh, two, and especially in a math class, this has been my biggest, most moving one that I use, and it's building the growth mindset. So is anyone in here not a math person? Don't even raise your hand. Don't even do it. Because there's no such thing as not a math person. 
Oh, listen to the, oh, wait, did I, oh, I just, no, I left the quote on here. Oh. I saw this quote, I heard this quote. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. That's and true. that is legit, that is legitimately true. When someone is in the room thinking that they're not a math person, guess what, they end up being not a math person. Because when someone's thinking they're not a math person, the first struggle they get, they go, oh, shoot, oh, it's just me again. Just me, shorthanded. I, I just wasn't built with those brains. And they give up because they just already believe that they can't do it. Where someone who knows they can do it, they do not give up. They go, well, I didn't try this yet. Ooh, let me try that. Because they're believing they're a math person. And all it's just a matter of that. So anyway, <clears throat> um, so let's see. Know, know the students can grow their brain. All kinds of brain. Does anyone remember those videos back in the day? This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. And then like fry the egg. And then we all believe like those brain cells are never coming back. You're gone. You know, but they actually, the brain based research now suggests that actually you can grow your brain cells, like by practicing different thought processes and whatnot. So I always show this really cool video of two neurons connecting, because when someone's not a math person, that would be like me going to CrossFit and trying to like do a kettlebell and really doing a terrible job and then saying I'm not a CrossFit person, but really it's just I didn't practice enough. You know what I'm saying? So when you're learning math for the first time, you're Especially if it's the first time you're learning something, your brain cells going like this. It's like, oh, like they're trying to connect. But once you connect, then it, then it, then you got the path. And the more you practice it, that's doing the homework. The more it builds, right? So once students get that, that like it's not hard because I'm dumb or I am not a math person. It's just hard because I'm literally lifting this 500 pound weight for the first time. So I need to like lift it a little bit slow and then build up to it. So anyway, once I show them that video of the neurons combined with the fact that that's not actually true about not being a math person, anybody can be a math person, they just have to decide on it, then then all of a sudden you got a bunch of people coming out of the woodwork that are like, I can do this after all, and they're suddenly, so I'm trying to, I don't want to miss anything. Um, so I always show the video with the neurons connecting, and then the, the right, with the right mindset, so here's the thing, and that, this goes back to the questioning, like if I believe that this guy couldn't do it, if I believe that as his teacher, that is, he's done, you know? Because if, if I believe that every single person here can grow their mind and do it, then I'm not going to hinder any, anybody with my particular feelings, you know? So, so it, in my mind, I have to no matter what think, like any single person in here can learn this, can do this, and it, it's just a matter of willpower. So if I, I have to first get over that hurdle, and then I have to teach them to not think that way about themselves. So the second I hear someone with that kind of talk, I just shut it down completely. I don't know. So anyway, those are the ways I, I, I think I think that's everything. I didn't want to forget anything, so I just did that. Yeah, that's it. Okay, Tina, you're up. You know, it's pretty amazing how this has come together, because we actually didn't coordinate this, but belonging is where I'm picking up at, and I'm going to talk about that but I want to turn it into something else. So a couple things that Roseanne just mentioned, um, I always tell my students when they say they can't do it, I say yet, you can't do it yet. If you say you can't do it, you just shut yourself down completely. So I will always interject the word yet to try to get them in the habit of at least giving themselves a chance. And then also, um, I'm glad you mentioned, I call it the self-fulfilling prophecy. If I see a student, I try to always come in with a positive mindset and not shut them down. So. I will constantly every day kind of recheck my assumptions at the door and have new belief every day because once you decide that student can't make it or that student is whatever the judgment is, it has a tendency to become true because you give that energy out and they feed it back to you. <coughs> so let me pull this up real quick. Um, my name is Tina. Um, I teach with these fabulous <coughs> other instructors. Where is the email? There we go. So I um, have just kind of an outline that I'm going to hit. I'm going to pass it out for you in just a second so you can look at it. And I'm just going to kind of go through what hasn't already been discussed. And then we'll talk about it. Sorry about the squiggles. Jeez. <laughs> I'm going to read some oh, squiggles. Oh, there's something for you. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. So I put together a little packet for you um, of some of the information I do. <laughs> it's all yours. Yeah, it's all yours. Right. Exactly. Try to make it easy. Um, so 
my overall operating principle has to do based on, I don't call it belonging, I call it mattering. There's a theory of mattering. It's, it was, um, I, I recently came across this term, and I'm like, oh, that's what I do. There's a theory and research behind it, um, and it's by Slossberg. And so I have uh, the attached document. Um, you can go through and read it on your own. I was going to show you some highlighted areas. But basically what it is, is mattering, is that you want the students um, to feel like they belong there, that they're, and that they matter, their success matters to you. So I do a lot of making sure that they know that bottom line, I want them to succeed, and I will constantly be reaching out for them. I'm going to find out information about them. I'm going to connect with them if I see them starting to slack off or starting not to get things in and find out what's going on. Um, but I want them to know that their presence in my classroom, their presence in my life, their success, their future success matters to me. And by doing that, um, I have another theory that it grows their respect for me. And if I can increase their, I don't believe that respect is something that is given. And so if I can increase their respect for me, they're going to work harder for me because they don't want to disappoint me. So that's my theory. I'm going to, I'll do research on that later. Um, so I have that article that you can go through and look at it. And I'm so passionate about this because I am first generation college student. And um, along my journey that was not linear, <laughs> It was a squiggle line to success. Um, the only reason I'm standing here is because I had instructors along the way who treated me like a human being, and they believed in me when I didn't have the belief in myself. And because of them interjecting themselves in my life, to the point where when I was going through a divorce, I had one teacher who said, I want you to take this $500. Take it. And I'm like, okay, I have kids. I can't pay rent. I, don't, I paid it back two years later when I started my master's. But just incredible experiences and I am just blessed and I want to pay that forward. So that's why mattering, it, it comes, it's personal. Um, I also had tremendous anxiety, I had perfectionism, I had teachers who like shut me down with, uh, well, you just need to get yourself, your, 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 your stuff straightened out or um, I had an anxiety attack, I was supposed to meet a teacher, I didn't show up, so the next time I showed up she's like, you lost your chance, you had it. And I'm like, whoa, so I know what those kind of words mean and I know how it feels. Um, so be careful with your language with your students and be, I know that sometimes we get impatient, it's the third time that they're late, whatever else, but you don't know what they're going through. And maybe it is behavior, but I always have the belief that they're teachable. And maybe eventually, and I, I do focus on the developmental education courses, so maybe eventually I can get them with the skills they need. So, and one of the papers I handed out to you is a questionnaire that I give to my students on the very first day. It used to be four pages, and I finally condensed it down to two because I don't need to be that nosy. So um, I do want to bring that up. Um, I'm actually going to show you how I use this for my students. And I don't read them immediately. I actually wait a couple weeks until I have their names. And I kind of know what they look like. I know who they are. I know how they have exhibited themselves in the classroom. So, let's see if I can, should be able to click on this and pull it up. There we go. Um, so what I will do, can I make it bigger? Hmm. There, well, that's, there we go. So go the other way. So what I will do is I will take them, and I do this throughout the semester. I don't try to do it all at once because it takes time to go through it. And I will write comments on it. So this one student, she writes, I, I want to know how long they've attended college, what their background experience is, because if they're first generation and they know nothing about it, they don't know what they don't know. And so I don't try to assume that they have this knowledge about how to navigate the college world when they've never been here and they don't have anyone they can connect to. Um, so this is my first semester of college. I graduated early. I am 17. I expect to graduate in the spring 2022 or 2021. So reading this, I want to make sure that I keep my jokes in class rated G. <laughs> I want to make sure that, um, you know, 17, wow. And this is somebody actually at 17, then their parents could actually be involved because it's 18 or older that their parents can't be involved. So I kind of needed to vote, although she's fine. Um, but so I'll write comments like, wow, you're extremely mature for your age. And then she's undecided, so I'm like, you have time. Explore options. Know that you can change areas of study as you progress. A decision doesn't trap you. And enjoy the journey. 
And then she writes about um, career goals. I truly have no clue. Something that makes me happy is the goal. And I'm like, so important. And I take pictures of this, obviously, and I keep it from my records. And I give them back the one I wrote on. And so they have that. I'm invested in them. I know a little bit more about them. Uh, I know if there's any issues that they are dealing with. And it's that they wrote it on first day. I have, uh, it gives me a little bit more validity or more belief that what they write on the first day is probably true. So on the first day, if they're writing to me, they have three different jobs that they're holding down, or they have a parent they're taking care of, or whatever the issue might be. When it comes up as an issue later on, possibly, then I'm, a, I'm apt to believe that more than somebody who has five grandmothers who died in the same semester, which is pretty rare, but <laughs> it does happen sometimes. Um, yeah. So kind of going through this, um, I do want to, now how did I do that? Okay. Um, so this one student, she talks about, um, you know, I asked about hobbies because I, they don't need to be, what I noticed about this generation is they don't have a work-life balance. It's all academic. It's all what can other people externally validate themselves for. So I try to like find out ways, of, do they know how they are going to de-stress, healthy ways to de-stress. Um, if you're this one's doing yoga and swimming and music and acting, um, how to describe yourself in a hundred words. There's some really interesting answers I gave for that. What are they most proud of? Um, and I find that question is very enlightening because I want them to. Some people don't. I have actually had people say I'm not proud of anything I've done. There's nothing in my life that I've accomplished that I could be proud of. And that's really sad. And that's a student I know. They need some emotional support. I mean, I'm not calling up on the phone on the weekends, but in class, I'm making sure that they know that I care that they are in there. Um, a lot of times I get, I'm most proud of graduating high school. And I don't know about you, but that made me kind of take a step back. Like, okay, that was just expected. That was not something I was proud of, because that's just something you do. You graduate high school. Um, so that was really eye-opening for me that that was not the norm in this district area, or maybe just at any community college. I'm not sure. Um, qualities of the best teacher, um, qualities of the worst teacher. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. It teaches me a little bit about what students really want that connects with them. And then I put this question on there for a reason. If you're not successful this semester, what would mostly likely be the reasons for it? I had a teacher at my previous college, and she was getting her master's degree, and so she did a thesis, and it was based on this question. They found out there was a high statistical, there was a high correlation, as it was more qualitative. Um, there was a high correlation between the students who actually gave an excuse, if they said, um, maybe my job might get in the way, or um, I might be sick. If they gave an excuse of why they might not be successful, there was a correlation between those students and the students who didn't make it to the end, who didn't do well. If you had a student who said, nothing is going to get in my way, I will be successful, those are the students you didn't have to worry about as much. So it's another way where I kind of weed out, these are the ones I kind of need to watch, and these are the ones that are probably going to be okay because of that self-efficacy that they're demonstrating. So we have a psychology person in here. Here. Right? Jim? Um, so hopefully you're agreeing with some of the things I'm saying here. This has all been just kind of in the base, in the classroom based experiments. My classes every semester are case study. It's a work in progress and trying new things every semester. What I have found most of all though is just to show that you care. That carries so much weight. Um, so as far as communications, this questionnaire is a big one that I do. And then another one I do is the Remind app. Anybody use the Remind app? All right, great. So the Remind app, it's remind.com. It's free. There is an app for it, the Friends app, on your phone. Um, students can download that app, um, or they can sign up via text if they don't want to use storage on their phone. So either way is fine. And it's pretty darn rare that I get a student who doesn't at least have texting ability. Um, and it also can come through email if need be. So. The reason I use this, let me go ahead and log in real quick so you can see it. <coughs> I knew that was going to happen. I wrote down my password before uh, class just so I can make sure that that didn't happen, which is me, it was going to happen. Um, 
So at the very beginning of the semester, and it's very easy to use. The first semester I used this as anybody who does anything new would get a little bit anxious about it. So the first semester I used this, I set up myself an account here. It does step-by-step instructions as far as what you tell your students. So when my students would come in, I would say, okay, go to your store, download the app. It's a blue background with a white cloud. Or just full type for text instructions. And then I give them a code that you get when you establish a class. And it's usually something like, I get to make up the name for it. So I'd say at math, whatever. Whatever the code is. And they would download the app, and the first thing the app wants from them is this. And then they're in. It's that easy. As far as how to set up a course, it's very straight. I thought it was pretty intuitive, but if any of you try it and you get stuck on that paper I handed out to you, you have my cell phone number, and just send me a text or send me an email, and I'll send you back a little video or something to help you go through it. Now the reason I use this is, oh my gosh, for multiple, it's my life, it's my, I have to have it. First of all, texting. Students like texting. Students respond well to texting. Email, I try to train them to check their email at least once every couple days, but they're not as prone to check their email as frequently. I've had students who come up with their mail and it has like 32,000 messages, and I'm just like, you're making me shudder. So the Remind app comes up like messaging. And so when they get a message, it comes up as a notification immediately, and then they're more prone to check it. On my end, as opposed to, why don't I just text? And I don't mind my students having my cell phone number, that's just my prerogative. But when I text, I don't like sharing other students' phone numbers with them. So if I had to send out an announcement to the whole class, and I sent it by text, traditional text, I would send it to the first person, copy my message, paste it to the second person, paste it to the third person. I would end up sending like 30 separate messages, which is, yeah. So with this, you have everybody in there from day one, and I can send out a blast message, and they all get it, and it doesn't share information. They can also share information with each other. So that's something that's very convenient. Because it comes up as a text message, if they sign up for that way, or as a notification on their app, then what I send them, they actually get. So like this is for my stat class, and we were doing inverse norm, which is to find, we have the area under a curve and a normal distribution, and we want to find what x-axis values go along with that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. And so the calculator function for that is you have to put the parameters of the area that's to the left of the value you want, comma, the mean, comma, the standard deviations. And so to get them with that stuck in their head, inverse norm, inverse means opposite. This is, I do a lot of adult learning techniques in my class where I try to connect it to something that's already pre-existing in their head, because I have a terrible memory. I have to do that. So inverse norm, inverse is like opposite. Norm, Beyonce is the opposite of normal. We do not live Beyonce lives. Beyonce had a song a few years ago called Irreplaceable, to the left, to the left. Okay? And many of them know that. So after I did that lecture last week, I was driving my car, I was at a red light, and the song, that darn Beyonce song is on my radio right now, that makes like four times this week. And then yesterday I heard it again. But it's just humor, it's just like a shared experience. And they can share stuff like that. I will share articles about if it's relevant to education, non-cognitive characteristic developments, affective characteristic developments. If there's happenings around school, those flyers, you can post on here, and they get that. Or just write about it. So it's become a really good way for me to just communicate with them. When they're absent, it's super easy for me to go on there after class and be like, hey, I missed the union day, is everything okay? So I always phrase things in a concerned fashion, in a positive way. I don't be like, why weren't you here today? It's always like opening and let me know. Communication is key. Even if it's just to say, I really didn't feel like being there and I didn't go and I know I should have. I try to get them to the point where they don't even admit that. And they know I'm not going to be like, that's on you. We try to talk about it and grow from it, that whole growth mindset. As far as time, okay. So any questions on Remind Help? 
So I recommend you, it's free, um, and I just have found it's been a really awesome experience. And I do encourage them, yes, I teach math, but I know my college experience, and I think we all should get a degree for being able to just navigate the college world, um, because it's never easy. So I let them know that, and I'm like, you have my information, communicate with me for life. And as you go through, even if it's not math related, it's, I don't know, should I drop? Should I, I don't know the question about this college. Whatever it is, ask me. And I'll, uh, if I don't know it, I'll send you to the right person. Um, so I try to make sure they know that I am a reference for them as well. And it goes back to that, I care about you getting through this. Um, as far as respecting the world, really quickly, um, yeah, our students are fabulous. And it is amazing to me what they are trying to overcome. I have one student right now who just gave birth, and she's coming back to class tomorrow. <laughs> I'm like, seriously? Well, it was like a last week she gave birth. Um, I have another student who was homeless for a while that came back. I mean, it's just that the stories are tremendous. And I know that there's those, those one-offs that are not as motivated, but for me, I, I find more oftentimes than not, they are really wanting to succeed. So um, to respect their world, I tell them the first day that I have what's called an extension policy, which is if you miss any due date, no matter what it is, if you let me know within 24 hours, no questions asked, I automatically give you 48 hours more. And even beyond that, um, there are times that something comes up and they may need more. So like I have one student who just revealed to me she's been absent a few days. I really try to push as much as I can to not drop them from non-attendance. Like I will try to stretch to see what's going on because that's their money and their time and if they can be redeemed, saved some way, I will try. And I just found out that in February her brother was shot and killed. Mm -hmm. And there was an article actually written up and so I was like, okay, this is kind of legit. And then she was wearing a shirt today that had the date. So I'm like, if this is a story, she's really going above and beyond to, to make a stretch. And so I'm like, okay, now we know that this is what we can do, what we can work with, and how we can make it work for you. So um, that is just a, one way, you know, they're respecting the world, of letting them know, hey, I know life happens. So this is what we can do. Um, the other soapbox I get on is equity versus, let me flip back, um, equity versus equality, because this is something I probably shouldn't even mention because it makes me so hot and heated. that I make the computer freeze up. It was there, okay. Um, is it here? Uh, there it is, okay. Um, and all I, mentioned, all I mean by that is that I hear sometimes fellow instructors, not in my department, who make comments like, well, I can't treat you differently, Juan, because if I did, it wouldn't be fair. I must have the same practice for every single person, otherwise it's not fair. So it's a hard line, if you miss three days, you're out. Or if it's a hard line, you miss that due date, oh well. And I'm like, but we're not all the same people. Equity, we all come from different backgrounds. So it's not, um, it's not making different rules for different people, but I, I'm not an absolute person. I think you have to take into consideration what's going on. So I, I always try to keep that in mind because if I wasn't treated that way, I wouldn't be here. Um, and then Roseanne and Schwan both talked about kind of conversational tone, um, humor, try to keep it conversational. I don't have PowerPoint, I try to keep it dynamic. I do weekly low stakes quizzes, like so low stakes that if you show up, you're probably gonna get 100 on it. Although I do give a grade, but I curve them at the end. And I do that to get them over the fear of getting things wrong. So at the end of the week, I'm like, here, this is what we covered. Show me what you know. And if you don't know, write down. I really didn't get this concept. And if I have the whole class missing it, it's a conversation with me. So I take them over the weekend, I come back, and I'm like, okay, this is something that I need to clarify. Because if this many people are missing it, that's probably me and not you. And so we have that discussion. So they feel engaged into the course, too. It's not just me doing this the whole time. And I always look at them, too. You guys know that part, though, as far as how to make that eye contact. Um, competency, that's what I'm referring to there. And then Joey, uh, Rosea talked about the growth mindset. But growth mindset also has to do with equity. Um, somebody believing that they can learn, you got to combine that with cultural background, too. 
because some cultures, if they don't have um, this growth mindset can be equated to effort, but if they can't believe they can learn, um, that they are capable of it, that they matter, then they're not going to put the effort into it. That mattering is so important. Um, so I know that we're getting close on time, so I'm going to stop there. There's a, a lot. We could actually probably turn this into a day workshop as far as all the different things. So um, thank you for your time. And we'll stop there. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. What kind of roles do you have besides secretary? I like the idea yeah, of treasurer. roles. I really like the idea of having roles in class. Well, um, secretary was the first one I started off with. <clears throat> well, um, last semester, I started off with a CEO in the class. And the CEO in this person, um, in this case, it was a new position that started, but the CEO in this case designates who's going to be the, the speaker for the day. So <laughs> it's not me choosing the students, it's them choosing each other in this case. And sometimes the CEO, from the last class, the CEO made it a, a group discussion, saying, OK, who wants to present today? And basically what the presenter does is give a summary of what we talked about and maybe give two or three examples for those people who didn't catch it. What did you talk about that day or the uh, last class? The, la the previous class. You guys, there was a story I forgot to share. And it was a really good one. Um, so it has to do with the, the growth mindset. So I don't know how I found myself coaching volleyball because I've never played and I'm scared the ball's going to hit me when I am playing. <laughs> but I, I would just YouTube videos beforehand and figure out how to, the, the physics was the part I was vibing on, right? So I had this girl, she was so anxious, like anxiety ridden. And like, I honestly was like, oh no, like man, this is going to be a rough season for her. I was really nervous about it. She's like, Miss Bell, and I don't think I'm ever getting this ball over there. I was like, okay, whoa, time out. Okay, we need to stop right there. You need to say to yourself, I'm going to hit this over. I got this. She's like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I'm, and I'm in my mind, I'm like, yikes. Like, I was so nervous. I kid you not, you guys, she got up and went, boom, and nailed it over. And I was like, how did you do that? And she's like, I just kept telling myself I got this. I mean, I, I, you, I literally, it was like a modern day miracle. I am not kidding around <laughs> that this girl got over the net. And it was because she said it to herself. So anyway, like that, you know, yeah. that positive thinking cures on um, like testing anxiety and all kinds of things. Right. I, I, I will mention about positive thinking. I'm like, I know it sounds kind of like hippie talk. Right. But, but it's like, it really, what you say and what you think has power. So if you are mm -hmm. negative in your thoughts, you will dampen the energy of you being successful. So even if you think you're lying to yourself and you're like, I'm telling myself I can succeed, but you have that little voice where you're like, you know that you really don't believe it, but you're going to say it anyway, it still helps um, to, to at least give you hope. But if they can't say, I can do this, then at least say, I can't do it. There's that yet word again. I can't do it yet because it makes a difference. Thanks, Fred.